everybody, uh, it's Pat, the sales engineer, and this time we're going to read uh, probably a couple of chapters because they're a bit small. I'm really trying to keep under a thousand words per, uh, per chapter. So let's get right in with it. This chapter is called The Exchange of Goods, and this is from my forthcoming or upcoming uh, book, on sales engineering, heretofore untitled. Barter versus trade. They sure sound the same, don't they? Actually, in the terms refer to different methods of moving money or goods around. In the case of barter, which is older than trade, the exchange is goods for goods. No money is exchanging hands, which is why it was uh, used far. You have to excuse me. This is a cold read of something I banged out and I haven't read it since I did. And so the spell checkers and spell correctors and everything have done their thing. And it makes it very hard to read <laughs> when they took a little bit of license. <clears throat> no money is exchanging hands, which is why it was used far, far earlier than the invention of currency. Bartering on a local scale meant that the other party had access to the same materials so the inherent value was the same. But if the materials were hard to obtain, even in the same area, they could be given a higher value, even though both parties have access to the same materials. Another consideration in local bartering would be if the materials needed to be prepared in a fashion that required, say, a significant expense of labor or skill. But a much less labor-intensive approach would be to barter with a party in an area that doesn't have the advantage of your natural resources, and vice versa. The problem there, of course, is that there is no control over what goes for how much, and you couldn't arrange a deal in advance. It could even be different money systems, things like that. You are really at a disadvantage uh, if you... We're the one traveling to the other. Not only did you, your time and expense go into traveling, but at the end, there were two things you wouldn't have any control over. One was what the, par the other party thought your goods were worth, and two, as you've no doubt guessed, was what value, was what value, was what value would they attach to the goods they were giving you in exchange? Both parties back then, as today, would overestimate the worth of their own goods and underestimate the worth of the others. And if you couldn't find someone to deal with, then you just went back. And if you were looking for a big difference in available resources to barter between, the value of your goods went up the further you traveled. Money changed all of that. You didn't have to carry goods at all. You could go anywhere you liked, local or not, and just trade your money for goods or services. Wealth became not who had the biggest stockpile of wealth, but who had the most money. Well, stockpile. Who had the biggest stockpile of stuff? It became who had the most money. Better way to put it. The difference is pretty significant. Suppose you were sitting on tons of furs, ready to wear or use, but nobody wants them. Everyone already has all the furs they could ever use. Are you wealthy? Maybe. But you can't unload one single fur to anyone around you, so their value goes down. Remember the stories about the gold rushes, where in the mining towns, a haircut would go for a hundred times what it would in the real world. Supply and demand and taking in goods uh, gold, in that case, uh, for goods or services was trade. My neighbor has no furs, but lots of currency. They are wealthy in a very versatile way. They don't need to find people without furs as their currency, as long as it is within the area recognizing that currency and is valued consistently uh, or reasonably as you do, can buy anything. Gold or other precious metals were used before coinage, and even salt was used as currency in certain situations. Gold was an early favorite as it never rusted or broke down, and could be melted to make it more pure. 
It could be shaped, melted down, and reshaped as often as desired. The fact that there wasn't much of it around early on made it valuable, not the fact that later it would be fashioned into coins. Now, trade actually encompasses, or includes, bartering from our barter system. What I mean by that is that all bartering is trading, but not all trading is bartering. Trading and the development uh, of our week are tied to one another. The week is essentially the days between market days, where the community and travelers would get together on an agreed upon day to buy and sell. It was a lot easier to use markets than just standing around hoping a buyer or seller would walk by. Markets also allowed the exchange of news and ideas. While farm goods would stay fresh short distances, long distances were a problem for consumables. Ebola, probably the earliest Syrian kingdom, I think the spell checkers ruined that word, regulated trade with silver. They established a value for a certain weight of silver and all the goods prices were fixed against that standard. Standard. All this was documented and in wide use back in 2500 BCE. An interesting concern of the day was translation of language, as there are many dictionaries for distant languages with Sumerian translations found throughout archaeology. And that tells you that they were doing a lot of trading with a lot of different peoples. You might think that bartering is long dead and that everyone buys and sells with currency or in trading. At all levels, bartering is alive and well today. Many, many cities organized, uh, boy, that is an awful translation. Many cities organize what are called barter exchanges. Small companies can deal face to face while large companies or corporations may exchange things like advertising or media exposure as leverage. Some actually use a trade credit, which is agreed upon and in writing. The IRS now requires barter exchanges to be reported as per the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act of 1982. You didn't think they wouldn't want their cut, right? For variations on the theme, you can just Google up or, or see local exchange trading systems. So that's the exchange of good chapter. Like I said, uh, goods chapter. Like I said, they're, uh, they're coming pretty small. So let's talk next about the introduction of currency. Coins were first thought to have been religious trinkets used in religious rituals, and maybe even distributed by priests. The earliest known were from the Kingdom of Lydia in Iron Age Anatolia. Coins are, coins as we know them, evolved from other shaped metals or materials in various forms. If the form was standardized, typically called an ingot, it would mean that the value was set and agreed upon by a standard, there's that word again, typically the local kingdom or other authority. The Late Bronze Age peoples used tokens or shaped metals in ingots to, to represent their currency, but there weren't markings on them. Aristotle said that the first place that issued coins was Demodike or Hermodike of Chime. Chime was a K-Y-M-E. Chime was an ancient metropolis located in coastal Turkey. The name Hermodike doesn't sound familiar to you, but you probably know her as Queen Midas. That's right, the wife of the guy whose golden touch was only cured by the god Dionysus. The term money is thought to come from ancient mythology when Zeus tied Hera with a golden chain halfway between earth and the heavens. Hera pronounced maneta uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Greek mythology, um, was lonely up there, and the word for lonely in Greek is mon, M-O-N-E, or monere, M-O-N-E-R-E-S, and I have the Greek translation, which means alone or uniquely alone. Hera broke her golden chain with the help of Hephaestus, and the gold chain fell to earth and became money for mortals. Did you know that all the gold in the world, above ground, that's been mined already, if collected together would form a cube 20 meters on each side or 60 feet? Another fact about gold is that metal backing, metal, 
Another fact about gold is that metal backing much of our paper currency is that price fluctuations in gold's trading price are not because the value of gold is changing. It actually reflects the value of the currency changing. I'll dally for a moment longer here to suggest that you read the Jekyll Island story. Uh, this is, uh, quote, the birth of the Federal Reserve System. This is in uh, Anthony Reingles's R-E-I-N-G-L-A-S. Uh, I think this screwed this up. Thy Kingdom Come, Overcoming a Failed Economy. To find something actually interesting on this very topic. It is thought that because the gods were involved with the Hera myth, gold was only used until 390 BCE. In ancient Greeks, in t this is really awful. I didn't do it voice to text. This is actually me typing horribly fast. It is thought that because the gods were involved with the Hera myth, gold was only used until 390 BCE in ancient Greece in temples and graves, and certainly jewelry. In that year, King Philip II of Macedon made gold coins for all of Greece. It's funny and poignant today that the Greek word for money, numisma, N-U-M-I-S-M-A, or namisma, means to the Greeks, it is something we think has value, or something that someone convinced us it has, but in reality it has not. In China, round coins were popping up in the 4th millennium BCE, with Rome not catching on until 289 BCE. In the United States, we've had coins at one half a cent, two cents, three cents, and even 20 cents. And did you ever wonder why certain coins have those little ridges on their edges, like quarters do? It is from the practice of detecting clipping easier. Clipping is simply taking a little off a coin and adding a lot of clippings together to get an appreciable amount of metal for free. So that's why you see those little ribby things on the outside edges of uh, some coins. Currency, whether uh, coins, credit, backed, paper, commodities, future stocks, etc., has allowed us to trade at all levels of society, acquiring it via any means. Gone are the days of bringing a chicken to fill up your car. In a way, it is kind of sad, because now money from a bank you rob spends the same as that hard-earned at minimum wage. Money no longer cares what kind of person you are, what your abilities are, or even where it came from. Your own merits no longer count for your worth in society. Your worth and value is now determined by your checkbook. And so that was that quick chapter. Yeah, it's only been 13 minutes. That's the, those two. So we're talking about worth and value, right? So this next quick, quick, short chapter talks about just that, worth versus value. According to Wikidiff, which is a site, wikidiff.com, D-I-F-F.com, uh, you put two words in and it tells you the difference between them. Worth is a synonym of value. Not so fast. As, no as nouns, the difference between worth and value is that worth is countable value, while value is the quality, positive or negative, that renders something desirable or valuable. You'll hear people use the two words in thinking that they're identical, but they're not. As verbs, the difference between worth and value is that worth is uh, obsolete or except in set phrases, to be, become, be tied, while value is to estimate the value of, judge the worth of something. As a preposition, worth is having a value of, proper to be exchanged for. To me, the difference is a little simpler to explain. The worth of something, anything, is the going rate, whatever the market will bear. If I want to sell my car, I look it up online and see what professionals list it as as well as what others are readily willing to pay for it. What are they selling uh, for these days? It, it doesn't matter if there is sentimental value, as the buyer will no doubt share my sentiments, experiences, or memories. 
So my car will sell for $1,000 or I will never sell it at any price because it was the car we shared so many memories in. We spent hours fixing it up, making road trips to faraway places. That car was always there for you. It never let you down. You will pour many thousands of dollars into it just to keep it running, long past the time for it to pass on to the junkyard to have its parts <laughs> stopped off <laughs> one by one. Uh, I think it's supposed to be stripped off. <laughs> parts stripped off one by one as its shell rusts away in the field. That car is family, man. And that's its value. The value to me is far more than it's worth. You don't worth something. You value it. And so that's how I differentiate the, uh, the two. And so here, 16 minutes in, I'm going to read the, the last of these. There was uh, four chapters total. So this is the last one. Retail sales and event inventions. Now, these... These individual chapters as part of the first section, as part of the first part of the book, will probably change, but not as much in this section. This section is actually laid out chronologically, virtually all of it. We're just dealing with some of the prep work now uh, for that video. So let's talk about retail sales inventions, and then uh, the, next, uh, the next video we'll get into canvassing and the uneducated customer. You are not likely a retail sales engineer, nor will you likely become one. The reason is that they don't exist. Sales engineers are for larger sales that have long sales cycles with several prospect contacts and multiple simultaneous efforts on your side. Retail is the opposite of a sales cycle. There is only interaction with a prospect if the prospect asks for it. But just because retail sales doesn't involve sales engineers doesn't mean it's irrelevant. The same mindset or mental mechanisms used in retail sales are present in larger deals, from the consumer's perspective, that is. Unaware of it, the buyer goes through the same mental genuflecting when buying anything expensive that they are not an expert in, which includes a car, like we talked about before. So for just a minute or two, we will look at how that experience has changed for our buyers as they shop for everything in their lives, not work related. Continuing on after that short little break, and I probably will get another phone call interruption shortly. The birth of modern retail in the 1700s and 1800s is marked by the development of the department store, chain store, and the price tag. We also have the bottle the Sears Roebuck catalog, the receipt, cash registers, and even the vending machine all happened in this early period. Advertising, a huge money mover in its modern form, is invented along with the telephone. <laughs> Those two go hand in hand, huh? Since that period, we have been introduced to things like a price gun, the shopping cart, and a supermarket to push it around in. Air conditioning brings customers in past the neon signage so they can fill their shopping bags. At night, they can still shop thanks to fluorescent bulbs and credit cards. Credit card debt soon followed. You could be seen on CCTV surveillance cameras taking clothes off the hangers, using your calculator to see how much money you had left after buying something, heading to the checkout where you put your goods on a conveyor belt, your barcodes got scanned while you watched an in-store television and watched a forklift move some pallets. All those things, what I'm trying to say, every one of those little elements was all invented for sales and the delivery of goods. Your smartphone scans branded items to see how much they are at the online store. And you can put your leftovers in that Tupperware in your electric refrigerator for later. In the 1910s, women became, this is a quote from adage.com, women became the nation's primary purchasers of consumer goods, making 85% of consumer purchases. In advertising, however, women worked on products for the woman's market, food, soap, fashions, and cosmetics, 
Men moved through training programs, working through all the departments to find the right job. Women started lower as secretaries or researchers trying to get noticed as copywriters, end quote. It is critical to see how fast things change so late in history. We are in business. We are in business consumers drawing parallels from our personal retail experiences. Uh, I think that the, I typed too quickly when I wrote that. We are business consumers drawing parallels from our personal retail experiences. In other words, we we buy and choose and evaluate the same way when we're doing uh, requests for quotes and proposal and information, the same way that we buy a jar of mayonnaise. So buyers of high priced uh, software that sales engineers help sell to them are still in their minds going through the same processes for buying decisions that they do when buying tires for their car. An interesting thing to keep in mind as we look at how sales methodologies evolved is just that. They evolved. Each new one was developed with the lessons of the last designed to be perfect for all time. Nobody creates something saying, well, this will last a few years tops. Our brief history of sales continues now with these breakthroughs as the backdrop for the processes and methodologies that make the art of sales engineering a science. Maybe not an exact science, but a science nonetheless. This seems a good time to introduce or uh, define a few terms in this whole process, as they are sometimes confused among each other. There are four terms or identifiers that we use in sales engineering more than any others. Uh, and I list five. <laughs> First is the supplier. And I try to start from the beginning to the first is the supplier one who crafts manufactures or fabricates the thing or stuff they're usually the shippers or deliverers of said goods distributor seller this is where sales engineers are we are part of the selling team with a sales rep or just rep typically having the most at stake not us they do in big ticket software the supplier and seller are typically the same company prospect Someone who has not yet bought our stuff. They may in future or they may not. Getting their attention is called prospecting. An existing customer can still be a prospect if they are looking to purchase additional things we sell. In other words, if you have not sold something to someone, they are not called your customer. Customers have bought your stuff. Oh, seeing those two confused all the time drives me crazy. <laughs> They're prospects if they haven't bought anything. Customers already have. So... Our fourth is, you guessed it, the customer, someone who has already bought our stuff. It could even be a channel or a reseller of our. And finally, fifth, the consumer, sometimes called the end user. This is the party that actually uses and benefits from our stuff. They may buy our stuff directly from us through a consultancy or even online. Early on in our 50,000 foot timeline, we will see how it all started with one-to-one face-to-face -one -face sales and quickly turn more industrial as demand outweighed <laughs> demand outweighed demand how <laughs> supply out outweighed demand and cost of goods became significant in price-based competitions and that's it for those those four chapters we went through um the exchange of goods introduction of currency worth versus value and finally retail sales inventions and how they impact us so uh, everything including this next two chapters are going to be not necessarily chronological so far we've been all over the place just trying to hit the high points hit some fun stuff really not trying to get too dry and, and boring after the canvassing the next chapter and the uneducated consumer the chapter after that we come into the rest of the section, except for about five chapters after it. The rest of section one, the history and evolution of sales, deals with a chronological way of looking at things, which is uh, far more easier to, to grasp for big picture folks. Uh, a lot of it's the uh, by decade, but there's a lot of things, very specific things, like in 1916, the World Salesmanship Congress happened. Very specific things that showed uh, a turning point for us as sales engineers with regard to methodologies. So 
the remaining, say, 80% of this section deals with chapters, <laughs> deals with chapters, has chapters that deal with methodologies, the mechanics of selling. Since we've already talked about trading and we've already talked about bartering and everything, the science comes in in the Victorian age where everything became a science. And then we start seeing how people are trying to apply crazy things to science, things that should not be associated with science. We try to make scientific. And uh, finally, we get into uh, much more current where we talk about solution sales, uh, selling to zebras, and, and uh, the latest one uh, my last company is using, the, the challenger sales methodology. Uh, so there you go. And we'll finally wrap that whole section up with why sales methodologies work in the first place. Why even bother? And that's it. So the next ones, if we're doing them in order, will be uh, canvassing and the uneducated consumer. Thanks, guys. <laughs>